Hey everybody, I'm Dylan. This is Bryce. Today we're going to be continuing our series on uh, ancient heresies in the early church. Today's topic is going to be the Pneumatomachy. Bryce, who are the Pneumatomachy? Right, Dylan. So generally, this is the part of the presentation where we have a sweet multiple choice and you guys get to test your knowledge and it's just a lot of fun. Um, someone, I won't say who, didn't go through the trouble of making a multiple choice for this one. So you just get a boring definition. In any case, the Pneumatomachy were, in fact, a 4th century Christian sect. The name itself means spirit fighters, and they believed that the Holy Spirit was a gift from God to believers, but was not a member of the Trinity, or divine in any sense, really. Um, they just saw th thought that the idea of Trinity was unnecessarily complicated and figured, let's keep it simple. Um, one of their main appeals for this, or main sources for this, was in Amos 4.13, which reads, or at least at the beginning, he who forms the mountains and creates the Hebrew word ruach. Now, ruach is a word that can mean either wind or spirit, but the Pneumatomachy took it as spirit and saw it as a reference to God creating the Holy Spirit. They also appealed to John 1.3, which teaches that everything was made through the Son. And the result was they generally held to this worldview where the Trinity was a hierarchy with the Father um, creating the Son in an Arian manner, and then the Son with the helping the Father to create the Spirit and everything else. So in essence, the Spirit w is just a spiritual creature um, created for mankind's benefit. Well, Bryce, let's do a quick multiple choice right here. Everybody, who responded to the Namaki? Was it A, Gregory of Nazianzus, also called Gregory Nazianzen? Was it B, Basil of Caesarea the Great? Or was it C, Athanasius? Or D, all of the above? Yeah, it was D, all of the above. Oh, good save, Dylan. <laughs> Thank you. The first person that we're going to talk about that responded to um, the Pneumatomachy was Gregory Nazianzen. And he responded in a three-pronged systematic theology of spirit. The three prongs were sanctification, unity of the Godhead, and worship, which was a practice. So... Sanctification, he draws off of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, especially the 42nd verse and, and on from there, where we will become like Christ. So if the Holy Spirit is to assist us in our faith and to help us become godly, but doesn't share equally with the nature of the Father and the Son, how is he able to make us godly or to join us to the Godhead? This idea that Gregory is um, portraying forces us to acknowledge two other ideas concerning the Holy Spirit. The first one of these is, again, the unity of the Godhead. Gregory taught that the respective properties of the persons of the Godhead, which is the unbegotten Father, the begotten Son, and the preceding Spirit, give the respective names of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this way, the unity of the Godhead is preserved even as the uniqueness of its three persons is made clear. Now, for the third, the third point of this, this systematic theology is worship, which is, as I said, a practice. Since sanctification the first prong, is a work of the Holy Spirit, and because sanctification was under attack, Nazianzus pointed toward the church's established practice of worship and praying in the Holy Spirit in the, in the vein of Jude 120 as a defense of orthodoxy. He argued that prayer to the Holy Spirit is, in, a, in essence, the Holy Spirit offering prayer or adoration to himself because praise and adoration to one member of the Trinity is praise and adoration of the three. This is true because all aspects of the Godhead, include the, including worthiness of honor and worship, are always and have always been equal among all members of the Trinity. And on the first slide, I put this quote from Gregory, but I really like it, so I think it bears repeating. For Gregory, when he says God, he means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The second person that we're going to talk about is Basil the Great. Bryce, tell me about Basil the Great. In his defense of the divinity of the Holy Spirit, Basil points primarily to scripture, but he also subsumes ideas like normative worship practices and experience under um, his exegesis of scripture. So, for example, he would point to Jesus' command of baptism in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission, which um, points to baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he would argue that not only do we see the idea of the Trinity in Scripture at this point, but because the church was actually baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and baptism 
was seen as um, a way to welcome Christians into the Christian community and into the church. Um, that points to that the church is not only the church of the Father, but the church of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He would also point to the idea that the Holy Spirit affects salvation in Ephesians 1, where the Holy Spirit is referred to um, as a seal of salvation. Now, we see throughout Scripture that only God can save. So the fact that the Holy Spirit is involved in salvation um, hints at his divinity. Um, we also see in Scripture that the Holy Spirit is portrayed as sharing equal honor and dignity with the Father and the Son in regards to worship. And it stands to reason, according to Basil, that he also shares an equal nature because of that. Um, Basil would also point to the affirmation that only the Holy Spirit knows the things of God that is found in Acts 5 as a strong indicator of the Holy Spirit's equality with God. The final church father we're going to look at in regards to the divinity of the Holy Spirit is Athanasius. Um, he, along with Basil, wrote interpretations of Amos and John that protected the divinity of the Holy Spirit. In regards to Amos, he simply pointed out that the Hebrew word ruach, which was often interpreted spirit, could also mean wind or breath, and suggested that one of those would be a more appropriate translation. Um, in regards to John, he pointed out that the spirit isn't mentioned by name and as one of the things that was created and postulates that it was probably um, left out because it wasn't meant to be included in that list. It wasn't included in the all things. Um, Athanasius also appealed to practice and tradition, um, much like Basil, um, as ways that, we, that would support the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Um, in terms of practice, we see this really clearly in the baptismal formula, as we've already talked about. Um, and in terms of worship, it was just normative for the church communities at that point to offer worship to the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit was not a member of the Trinity, this would be a form of idolatry. Finally, um, Athanasius wrote a treatise on the Holy Spirit, um, in which he said, and I quote, um, The Spirit is fully divine, consubstantial with the Father and the Son. Consubstantial just means of the same sub substance. The Spirit belongs to and is one with the Godhead, which is the triad. The Spirit comes from God, bestows sanctification and life, and is immutable, omnipresent, and unique. The triad is eternal, homogeneous, having one nature, and indivis indivisible. And since the Spirit is a member of it, he must therefore be consubstantial with the Father and the Son. He belongs in essence, to the Son, exactly as the Son does to the Father. So, in keeping with our other tradition of linking what we're talking about in the early church with stuff that's modern, um, we're going to talk a little bit about Unitarianism, which does something very similar. The modern heresy um, of Unitarianism combines both Arianism and the New Matamaki. And it's a theology that, that insists that the Christian God is just one person, not a trinity, and regards the Son as a prophet, but not God, and the Holy Spirit as an agent of God, but not God. Unitarianism began after the Radical Reformation and during the peri period of the Enlightenment, when deism rose up, which was an intellectual and rational endeavor to understand God by means of reason alone, and thus rejected both church tradition and scripture as authoritative at any point where it clashed with reason. For deism, on the concept of the Trinity arose a group of anti-Trinitarians who were later formalized in the late 18th century as Unitarians. Unitarianism, unlike its or rather like its parent deism, rejects both church tradition and scripture as authorities within the church and was openly condemned as a heresy when they rejected the Nicene Creed. So there are a few things that are good to take away from this video. The first and foremost is that Orthodox teaching on the Trinity must acknowledge the respective properties of the persons of the Trinity while also acknowledging a unified nature within the Godhead. The second point is that Unitarianism is a really good example of a modern heresy that can come about when there's an imbalance of how authority is viewed. Church authorities have always been scripture, church tradition, practice, and reason, as well as some other stuff, but when we start relying on just one authority, like only scripture, or only practice, or only reason, we can come up with um, some really bad stuff. 
So that's going to do it for this video on the Nematamaki. We'll have another one posted probably in about a week or so. But we just wanted to thank you guys for watching this and once again say that, um, you know, we appreciate comments in the comment box and we look forward to reading them and engaging with you guys. We also look forward to uh, reading your suggestions for topics that you might want to talk about. But once again, we just do ask that in keeping with the command of Jesus to be known by your love for one another, that any conversations that you guys have with one another stays civil and stays loving towards one another. Um, yeah, just give us any topics that you want us to look at and we can look into them. I'm Dylan. This is Bryce. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.